Science Central. So what made the discovery of microRNAs and the short interfering RNAs so important? Well, I guess they're important because they represent a completely new class of regulatory molecule that we previously had no idea about um, in eukaryotic cells, that is, cells with, with nucleuses, with a nucleus. Um, and what they're able to do is to switch things off. And, of course, when you think about a living system, everybody thinks about, oh, switching on genes. But, of course, expression of genes is not just a question of switching things on at the right time. It's also a question of switching things off at the right time. I'd say the first uh, shot of the RNA revolution was finding that, that genes in, in eukaryotes, which is what people are, uh, are split up, and that was a big surprise because we had been trained, we had sort of cut our teeth as biologists on uh, bacteria which don't have split genes, and that was a, a huge shock. And then it took another 10 years or so for very tiny genes to be discovered, and that's what uh, Victor Ambrose and David Balcom and I were involved in. It was in June of 1992 when Victor's lab had just figured out that the LIN4 gene uh, didn't code for a protein and coded for a very small RNA. And we had just figured out that the LIN14 gene uh, was defective in, an, in a region that doesn't code for a protein and also coded for an RNA. And we had talked in the afternoon about looking for whether there was any chance that the two RNA genes would fit together uh, that by looking at the sequence of letters in his gene and the sequence of letters in our gene that the letters would match with the classic Watson-Crick base pairing of A's and T's and G's and C's. And he looked and I looked and a phone call at, at 11 at night or whatever, midnight, do you see it, do you see it? Yes, and we rattled off the sequences and we had seen that there was multiple places where his gene and my gene would mate up together. And it was, those sequences were also the parts of the genes that were the least changed over evolutionary time which was a kind of proof that this was correct. So that was the first eureka moment. At the time, there really had been nothing like it described. There was no gene product so small as, a, as 22 nucleotides long. So the idea that such a small molecule could be a regulator um, and have such important impact on the development of this animal, C. elegans, um, was really quite astonishing. The initial discoveries that uh Gary Rovkin and Victor Ambrose made were based on genetics. Our work was really based on molecular biology. We did these experiments, we took genes out of viruses, we expressed it, them in genetically modified plants, and indeed we found that the, the genetically modified plants were resistant against the viruses, as we expected. But a surprising finding, and this was the sort of accident, we found that in the plants that were resistant, the, tr the transgene, the newly introduced viral gene that we had put into those plants, was actually switched off. So then we started asking why. And it turned out, cutting a long story short, it turned out because the transgene that we had put into the virus was doing something that we now called RNA silencing. So Gary and I found these small RNAs involved in developmental timing in the nematode, and David Balcombe found small RNAs same size involved in this um, host defense against viral pathogens in plants. So that convergence told us then that these small RNAs uh, were part of a suite of phenomena that must have evolved prior to these, the separation of plants from animals. So this would be many hundreds of millions of years ago. They're living fossils. They're uh, relics that still exist in our genomes, probably left over from the RNA world. It's pretty clear that the first life forms uh, were RNA-based, and so they might actually be ancient genes. The small RNA genes could be sort of a window to what the world was like before proteins were actually even invented. But what we have available to us now is an immensely powerful new technology involving sequencing of RNA molecules. And it means that we can, in one experiment, sequence tens of millions of these short RNA molecules. And this new technology is allowing us to see the enormous diversity and complexity of the small RNAs that are present in cells 
in a way that we were really not able to do before. Wherever someone, one looks in the cell, one seems to find involvement of small RNA-based genetic regulatory mechanisms. And so, regardless of what field somebody had already been studying, when the microRNAs and siRNAs and RNAi um, uh, emerged, that person could turn their attention to the potential role of a microRNA or the potential role of siRNA-based gene regulation. People who work on oncogenes are, are thinking hard about whether microRNAs are involved. Uh, we've found recently in some of our genetic research that, that a tumor-causing gene called retinoblastoma, which is in the worm related to what causes retinal tumors in people and is a very important gene in, in tumor genesis in people, uh, activates tiny RNA pathways. And, and in the worm, we showed that we could cure effectively what the, the, the cancer that a worm gets by inactivating RNAi. That doesn't mean that it's going to work in humans, but it means that clearly these tiny RNA pathways are part of what makes a tumor happen. So I can imagine powerful medicines being developed that are based on tiny RNAs plus the, the cofactors that are necessary for their, the dance they do in a cell, and that that will be a next generation of therapies that will, uh, as we discover how they're involved in the causes of disease, we'll also be discovering how they could be involved in the cures for diseases. So my hope is that maybe in the next decade or so, we'll go from a situation where we generally feel helpless, more or less helpless, about the suffering of people in the world, to one where we have the means to simply treat almost essentially anybody who's sick. In C. elegans, we can routinely knock down genes by simply feeding the worm bacteria that's producing a double-stranded RNA. If we can get the small RNA into the cell, it'll do the work. Mm -hmm.